So I'm Alexander Knoch from the University of Tartu in the Department of Geography and specifically in the Landscape Geographic uh, Geoinformatics Lab. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jan. Let's hope it doesn't crash anymore. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm in the zone now. Okay. Uh, which button would that be? Okay. So um, the Landscape Geoinformatics Lab is um, a working group in the University of Tartu in geography, and we really uh, focus on geoinformatics in the classic sense, applied geoinformatics, spatial data analysis, environmental modeling, spatial machine learning. Evelyn gave a great talk earlier today. Um, generally, geospatial data processing and visualization, and environmental remote sensing. Um, today, I would like to talk about our collaboration with the startup in Estonia, Arbonix. Arbonix is um, a, one of those uh, new um, startups that build on um, environmental sustainability, but for a business cause. So um, the idea that um, Arbonix is um, sort of uh, following through is to develop, let's say, a new grant, a new idea on how to do forest economy, not just chopping off all the trees, but doing that either sustainably or even getting paid for keeping the trees. So then we must get an extra income from the land um, and then in reverse, as the carbon, carbon credit uh, market works, voluntary carbon, uh, carbon market investors or, or uh, pumps want to offset carbon credits can buy those credits. So this way it's a win-win situation for the landowners, uh, for nature and um, uh, for the planet sort of in general. So we have been um, working with uh, Abonics since uh, last year and um, so that's sort of uh, a ac academia business collaboration. And what uh, Abonics needed uh, was basically to load all sorts of uh, environmental data, registry data, you know, contextual units, um, all sorts of um, constraints that would make sense where you shouldn't plant trees um, and where you can't plant trees and then combine that in a, in a way that this can um, be used to create um, a, a forestation plan, a land management plan, so in terms of GIS here, um, we really needed to combine spatial and tabular data, raster data, vector geometries, the classic suitability analysis, getting you know, the um, data from uh, different uh, layers, uh, remote sensing, um, and as we know, there's the problem of the modifiable area unit problem. You have like, different size uh, vector data with one value, then you have continuous raster data, and uh, maybe you have attribute data that is non spatial but sort of related to certain areas. And uh, Arbonics started in Estonia, but in the beginning already they indicated they're not going to stay only in Estonia, they want to do it for more countries. And so we needed, from the beginning, we needed to think uh, about um, spatial coordinate reference systems. Right? So, okay, maybe in Europe we can stay with the European um, ETRS 89, but maybe. That goes a little bit further in the north or in the west or in the east and the south. And then we might have to think of larger areas. In larger areas, we get the problem that um, if we think of suitability analysis and raster data, the grid cells, you know, they get bigger and bigger um, towards um, the, the, the equator. And so to do a, a, a nice recommendation and sort of a true to area to recommend. Okay, in this spot you plant these type of trees, in this spot you wait. Um, we really needed uh, a system that can do that. And also for subsequent um, machine learning and other reporting, ideally we could easily switch between tabular and spatial representation. And for that, we wanted hexagons. So hexagons are very good. Hexagons have a bit of a, of a hype cycle right now. Um, so we have Near that we've got to be careful not just any hexagons. Um, putting things in hexagons has advantages, uh, you know, because our neighbors, all the neighbors are always roughly the same distance and it's like a circle, so it's a nice shape. Uh, it's good to look at and you can actually fill areas quite uniformly. Um, but of course, as we go to larger areas, we cannot just use 
a normal hex plane that we then put on, um, on, on the plane, but it has to be somehow a hexagon filling for the planet, yeah, so to say. And uh, so we needed hexagons with a system. Yeah, so, and this system, um, ideally the grid cells, yeah, but each cell has sort of a unique ID because this works then really well in the tabular structure, right? So this cell with this ID and then we have attribute data, which is great. Then also it would be really cool if this ID has the logic for the geometry. If we have this ID from this cell and this table, we know where it is always and uh, what the resolution or the size of the cell is. That would be really great. Because then we don't have to look for the geometry only when we need the geometry, but for other associative analysis, like okay, um, like table joints for this type of soil, we can use those trees, and for that type of soil, we should use other trees. Because we can do all tabular, so we don't need to worry about um, data processing. Because tabular data processing can be scaled really nicely. And that is sort of um, what here this last bit means data can be stored and accessed in a distributed fashion because we can put tables where the IDs go from A to C, go in this computer, and from D to F, go in a different computer, and we'll always very easily find the, the IDs and so the related data. And as you can see, we can nicely you know, say, okay, in this cell, this is river, and in another cell, this is residential area. So this way we can do some really nice, um, straightforward computation analysis. So what system could that be? It's called a discrete global grid system. Okay? A discrete global grid system has a bit of a sort of um, clunky definition by the OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, calls a global discrete global grid system a spatial reference system, because it is a spatial reference system uh, that uses a hierarchical tessellation that just means chopping it into cells, um, to partition and address the globe. So in that sense, those cells, they have the knowledge, they know where they are always, and can be converted from geometry to ID back and forth, because the system itself has the mathematics behind it. It's actually complicated mathematics, but there is now software available, so which is really, really great. And this is what we did, we used that software to build this system. So we did a pretty classic suitability analysis. So this is just a small number of layers. For example, in forest change, the Hansen data set is one of the input layers. Um, because the idea is, if there has already been forest or since the last 10 years, they shouldn't get, you know, should be able to cheat that you put new trees there. So that, you know, that doesn't count. So you have to leave the trees. Um, and then other information like from the forestry, oh, sorry, from the, from the forest registry. So this is, I think, an example of um, from 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 that area. Um, so we have the cadastral unit, just a normal cadastral unit, and it's nicely filled with hexagons and a, a nice resolution of uh, roughly 25, 20, 70, 75 square meters, roughly eight by eight, nine by nine meters, which is a nice unit where we decide, okay, within that unit it doesn't make sense to have different trees. So that's at least you know, one unit of space where the same type of trees should grow. So what we then do, we generate these um, uh, hexagons, these cells, and they're nicely filled, and so one cell can only be either inside or outside. So, and this only works if we use like a reliable space reference system, not just a standard hex fill bin that is underlined, right? Like rasters. Rasters can be nicely Structure, but they can start at arbitrary um, points, so the rasters have to be intentionally aligned, we know that. So, uh, and so with the a DGGS hexagon grid, this is sort of automatically done. So then we take those and we fire those uh, cells, so like 20, 30 layers, vector, um, raster data, and then we aggregate them, we do the analysis, we say, and yet either it's suitable to put trees or not. So if it's suitable, then for those, we aggregate another 20 layers. And um, then our bodies calculate the second step, a so-called carbon opportunity assessment. That's their main product. And then, for example, you see for this unit, you get a nice report, okay, this is still not uh, suitable. 
But in this area, you know, Burnish would be the best one. Um, soy type, for example, Louis Swords, and then with the contract lengths of maybe 50 years and at a carbon price, it can of course be you know adjusted. That's just my example here, and that would be then the the income opportunity if you would uh, put trees in this currently not forested area. So that's how the product uh, basically works. The interesting bit where I really want to sort of nerd out a little bit is um, the technology. We have the GIS conference, Geospatial Technology Conference. So I really like to introduce a little bit of the technology set here. So we mostly use open source. Um, and as I mentioned, Garbonic is already uh, active in three countries. And um, the system is designed for on-demand queries. So the client goes in. In the beginning, we're not quite sure should this be a public application or not. It's now an internal um, application. So the client goes into our bonnet, so writes an email and says, hey, this is my congestion unit number. Um, what can I do with my debt? So then Abonix goes, puts the number in, files up the query, a minute, two maybe, and then the suitability analysis and uh, the report comes out. And they still while they're on the phone, they can already discuss the opportunity. For all the mapping um, stuff, we use the server, pretty straightforward. The front end is a Vue.js application with leaflets, nothing um, overly complicated here. It runs on Google Cloud Platform, but cannot run on you know, any system. And for the, for the uh, report, we generate that with Quarto and uh, Markdown, and the data that comes from the process comes out and is then ingested into this um, Markdown thing. The backend that glues it all together is uh, Python and uses fast API, Rust.io, and then GeoPanda, so quite typical toolkits. But what I really want to put a bit focus on today is the centerpiece. And our centerpiece is uh, based around Postgres, PostGIS, and the software called DGGGrid. So some of you maybe know me, some of you have maybe seen some of my talks, for example, last year I was writing a little bit about H3 because it's not equal in the area. But with DG Grid, we can have a nice global hexagon grid system that is um, equal area. So all the cells if generated in Estonia, in the north of Finland, in the south of Latvia, even in the equator now, if you would go there, expand there, uh, I would have the same. 75 square meters reliably. You can't do that with a raster. And um, why? You know, the talk started actually how we built a fast geospatial um, processing system. So the fast bit is ggrid is classically a command line application. It is C++, but it's a command line application, so using command line wouldn't really work on demand. You'd have to you know do some weird scripting. So what we did we did some um, glue code that we run DigiGrid basically directly inside the PostgreSQL database. So it's basically select for this congestion unit, get the geometry, and it's basically fill immediately from DigiGrid with the hexagon, and you can directly query all the other layers. And that goes really, really fast. The trade-off here in this situation is if the area will be too big, um, let's say thousands of hectares, then we have also tens or, or even hundreds of thousands of um, hexagons, and then it's still like a vector operation, still like a point and polygon query that then maybe takes a bit longer, maybe five minutes, maybe ten minutes. But um, the average, you know, pedestrian unit where the Owners call in. That is, you know, within within a minute. So here's a little bit of information about the tool because everything the tooling around is even open source. And with some of that, I you know took a little bit of pleasure in uh, in helping. Um, so the developer of that is actually a professor from the US, um, but he has now there's now several contributors to this tool. Um, it uh, has a nice GitHub, uh, GitHub action that's regularly checked, so it's a collective project. My contribution here is uh, now, this is some of you might 
use or know about Anaconda or the Conda Python package manager. Um, so GGG Grid is now literally since just one or two weeks accessible through Conda. And um, for those uh, who want to play around, this is a Python wrapper right now. You install both, and then you can run DigiGrid directly through Python. You don't have to write this command and stuff. So, so this has been um, been quite, as you can see here, also the latest version. This is a quite recent. Um, uh, we we also collaborated with some of that. So this is uh, sort of the center piece, and we link that directly into the Postgres database. Yeah. So coming to the end, um, even the United Nations has. Um, sort of define discrete global grids as a common geography, because this is really the theme, common geography. We don't have to deal with sliver polygons if the, you know, if the cutting and chopping off of um, uh, protected areas over soil units, over um, other units, and then your sliver polygon is really hard to deal with. Common geography will ensure that all statistical data and other data are geospatially enabled, Users can discover, access, integrate, analyze, and visualize statistical information seamlessly for geographies of interest. So this is, I think, what we feel we did quite nicely for, for our products. So a short executive summary for you guys. So for smaller, for smaller scales, our solution in this particular um, use case worked really well. As I said, the tooling is there. Um, it's really good for data aggregation, data fusion, like here. data fusion really because we use uh, even raster data, set up images from different scales, put it together in the same units, and then you have a nice tabular arrangement that you can use in all sorts of downstream processing and then machine learning. And the cell ID based encoding, this is uh, really nice also for selection, you can just select ranges of cells, and currently so we are sort of extracting best practices for efficient workflows, you know, the conversion index and so on. But yeah, so that's sort of the rundown how we build the fast geospatial data processing system for the new forest economy. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll quickly, quickly raise, if you're interested in open source uh, GIS stuff, come next year to Tatu, Fosco G. Thank you very much. Keep the microphone, we're going to have questions okay. um, Can you just quickly uh, reiterate the business model behind aeroponics? I'm a landowner, let's say I own lots of land, but okay. let's say I do have cadastres, I send my cadastre number to, to you, what, what, what are you going to offer me? Okay, first disclaimer, I'm, I'm the JS team, <laughs> not the sales team, but um, the business model is you call and you tell us your cadastre unit number, we give you a, another number, how much money you can earn if you put trees in certain places. Or some of the developments of that where if you keep trees in a certain place, um, those are the, the main things, yeah. So, uh, do I have to put the trees there or I don't have to? Do I get uh, the money without doing anything? The main, the main business model is around, uh, we develop um, a business plan and a afforestation plan where you put trees and then you keep those trees there. Okay, so I have to put the trees. Yeah. That's, oh, you crashed the computer. Ah. <laughs> no, that's, this Luckily, computer. this is not our GIS system. That doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Computers in here, they don't get a bubble, it seems. All right, let's see. Uh, hopefully our audience has uh, more uh, technical questions, uh, which are more of your alley, right? Yeah. So let's take the most popular one. What are your main data sources for this suitability analysis? Okay, this is a business secret. No. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, in Estonia, we are a bit spoiled, honestly. Like, after we expanded from Estonia to other countries. So, Estonia Land Board, we have almost all the layer from Land Board. We have, um, of course, ETAC. Uh, we have a forest registry in Estonia, we have um, protected zones, uh, peatlands, soil data. There's a soil data set in Estonia called East Soil. This is like an advanced version of the classic Estonian soil card with more data. In um, other countries like Finland and Latvia, we use additional um, remote sensing data like uh, the Hans data set for forest disturbance. Um, 
uh, land cover, the cooking land cover, yeah, that, that's sort of all that. I don't know the 100 layers by hand. Really? Roughly. Okay. Like 20, 30 layers. So, so you do it for a country? You still need, it's, it's still the land board is the main source of data for you. The main source, yeah. Okay. And in other countries, it's also the, the national. The NBMGO, NBMGO, we, we scoured uh, so that, that portal, uh, Lithuania, we also got um, good experience here and there. No, not Lithuania, sorry, Finland. In Lithuania, we're probably looking, I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, next question How much decisions depend on quality of underlying geo? Uh, Data, yeah, so uh, a lot. So this is like a really interesting lesson learned. Um, soil types is one example. So in some countries you have higher quality or higher detail soil data. But for example, Finland has a different approach to categorizing soils. And it took us a while to understand that and the mapping to, for example, the world reference based on URB uh, in Latvia that was easier. Uh, but in Finland, it took us some time to understand um, how that relates to our understanding, how we would, for example, map. So that's one thing. Another thing is, uh, of course, resolution. Kuhin is, let's say, coarser. Estonian land board, land cover data is much, much finer, much more detailed. So that, that really gives. And then the landowners ask, hey, here's, here's um, a peatland, why is that not mapped? Well, we don't know because we take the data, so we investigate. Um, why is that not categorized as a peatland in the original data that comes mostly from government agencies? There's a question about a competitor. Which product is better? Aerobonics or single earth? No, there's think, yeah, really yeah. one answer for you there, isn't there? Um, actually, <laughs> they are. You are not a They are not containers because they do different things. And I think that's the main thing we have to clarify maybe. So, aerobonics really helps you, um, the landowner. To work with carbon credits and the voluntary carbon market, carbon certificates, right? Carbon offset. Whereas single earth um, builds like a like a coin, like a like a blockchain based currency that is backed, you know, like our, our dollars are backed by the gold in Fort Knox. Mm -hmm. Single earth is um, the currency is backed backed on let's say nature conservation and, and uh, yeah, those type of things, biodiversity, uh, afforestation. So they have a diff they're really different concepts in a way. Yeah. So aerobotics is kind of introducing uh, the concept, this is more practical. Uh, concept of futures uh, when it comes to CO2. Uh, it's more, it's more applied, more, it's yeah. also more graspable, I would say. Okay, uh, let's take another one. Um, how smooth? is for you to receive data from Latvian national registries. Smiley face. Um, actually, our national register. So LD, so they're different, right? So we um, have the LDN Geo, most of that data is pretty easy to get because we just go to the portal. Cardassian data, I don't know anymore, but we get it regularly. So it works. Okay, so you get it. Yeah. In an okay fashion, okay man. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's take uh, one question you really like. I think. Can DGGS be used for building a data cube? If yes, what are the advantages, disadvantages compared to regular data cubes? Thank you very much for that question. I couldn't address that in my talk. I addressed it in all the other talks. I think we believe that the DGGS is a really nice um, uh, basis for a data cube. <laughs> Uh, especially because all the data cubes, even open data cube at the NGO, the presentation was really cool. Um, Australia, data cube, Swiss data cube, they suffer the situation, as I explained, that a raster can only cover such a large area before it gets really strongly distorted. So I think UTM zone is sort of the largest type of useful um, raster coded reference system, whereas the DGGS, uh, it's globally applicable. So, and you just drill through, like we drill through the data, and you get data to set. The only thing right now is um, we're still working a little bit on best practices uh, if we aggregate a lot of data. So right now we do data aggregation on the fly, 
whereas the most data cubes are ingesting the data and aligning the stuff and building a data cube and then have like three, five, twenty terabytes sitting in that server, where, but where all the raster grid cells you can then drill through. So that makes sense. So, uh, so then there's slightly different approaches. EGS is maybe not as well understood or not as, yeah, not as well understood. Do you monitor whether the landowners fulfilled their contractual obligations over the years? So that's business good. question again. That's a really good business question and I uh, forward you to uh, leave this department. Um, so that's, I think, a tricky situation for all the afforestation startups. So Afforestation is not the only afforestation, there's a couple of ones in the US, South America. So the monitoring will really be one of the main challenges. And there's where totally remote sensing comes into play, high resolution task, uh, also because, uh, again, because we work basically on pedestrian unit level. So you just have to monitor this one, and then maybe this one, and this one. So. Um, you can't fly drones everywhere. I think that doesn't work. If you have like hundreds or thousands of uh, pedestrian units to monitor, it doesn't work anymore. Um, um, yeah, sending an inspector like Vera to one in hundreds, a sort of uh, you know, sampling. Okay, that's the wire steel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's take a technical question. What resolution are you using for the analysis? So that is um, the. Uh, Equal area Snyder projection uh, resolution seven or no, thirteen I think, and that is um, roughly eight by eight meters. If you want to know the pixels um, in uh, square meters, is seventy five square meters that I showed at the beginning, which is like a nine by nine, but it's more like a circle right? because it's a hexagon. But the hexagon system is international. You're using an international standard. You've applied it. Um, Your solution, no? Uh, that's. Uh, I think that wording is maybe a bit difficult. So discrete over grid systems. There's an abstract. Why do you make things so difficult? In a simple way, like the five-year. Everybody can use that, but it's it's not a standard. But it's in that tool, and um, because you cannot build, if you want to cover the whole globe with hexagons, you can only have certain resolutions and at certain you know orientations. So there's only a handful of standards to select from and this is one of them. It's called ICI 7H. Okay. So it is an international standard behind it, but not you could call 100 percent it. It's not a like an official standard. Yeah. It's like a technical standard. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear you're using international standards. Okay. So checking the uh, questions here, mostly they are for your uh, legal and uh, sales team, uh, legal restrictions. Do you want to take any of, the, any of those? We're mostly out of time as well. Uh, you can pick one uh, yourself. Okay, okay. Which okay. you want to take? I would love to take the soil one, but I think this is a discussion we can have in the break. And then Arabonics issued carbon certificates certified under VERA or gold standards. This is a very important question, and it's a bit muddy, and uh, I don't know how to it. But I think they, they work with Vera right now. Yeah. And when they're really good, they will take over Vera. OK, but the uh, legal team is ready to take these answers, uh, questions, and uh, answer them. Uh, but thank you, Alexander, for giving a very good technical overview and uh, answering the questions in good manner. And you didn't crash the computer. So it was a joy. Thank you.